Hello, friends, and welcome to Wednesday Inspiration for March the 5th. Not March the 5th, April the 5th. Wow, that went quickly, didn't it? It feels like Lent just began, and now here we are in Holy Week. So I want to think today about how these are what we might call our days of awe. I was having a conversation with my good friend, Rabbi Bergman, um, and we were mentioning how these are our days of awe and their days of awe come in the fall, in the uh, September time um, with Yom Kippur and uh, Rosh Hashanah and those things. Ours are right here, right now. <clears throat> we are halfway through Holy Week. On Sunday, we hailed the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem with palms and with songs and with cries of Hosanna. We talked in Sunday worship about how Hosanna is actually a prayer, a prayer that means God save us. So that was what people were praying, not just, oh, yay, you're yippee, you're here, but save us, God, save us. Those same voices later in the week will join with others to make the cry crucify him because we are that fickle. We are that, that broken and wounded, just like the, uh, the people wandering in the book of Exodus were constantly tested and tried and really fumbling around to understand how to truly <clears throat> follow God, to live in freedom in the way that God intends for us, but freedom that comes with a responsibility. And so I thought that I would just quickly review for you some of the things that are coming up and have, have, have happened um, in this week, in this time in our story, after Palm Sunday, Jesus comes into Jerusalem and spends quite a bit of time in Matthew's gospel, which is what we're reading this year, um, spends quite a bit of time preaching and teaching, instructing people. He's in the courtyard of the temple. He's around Jerusalem. And he's always just one step ahead of the law because the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders and the temple police see him as potentially destructive of their shaky peace with Rome and definitely threatening to their sense of power and control of access to God. So up to this point, access to God was done through sacrifice and you approached the Holy of Holies, which was shielded from everyone except the priests by a curtain. And that sacrifice was made out in the courtyard area. Only certain people could go into the temple only certain others could go all the way to the Holy of Holies. It was a mystery that was separated. Now we are headed into a mystery of presence, a mystery of a different way of approaching God, a different way of being around God, a different way of God being around us. So Holy Week, the first few days, are about what Jesus did while he was in Jerusalem. And it's, it's an ominous feeling. It's like if, if this was a movie where the, the gloom would be gathering, even as he was talking with adoring crowds, because you would have this sense that, that, that things are drawing to a head and that head is not necessarily good. So Jesus on Thursday, on what we call Maundy Thursday, gives his disciples the mandate. That's where Maundy comes from. It's an odd old English word, but gives them the law, gives them the requirement to love one another. And he seals this with a meal. Now in John's gospel, it's done with foot washing instead. There are lots of ways that the Christians have expressed this, but this communion, this Eucharist, this feast of thanksgiving, thanksgiving for the life of Jesus, was given to us. And so tomorrow, on Thursday, the 6th, we will be breaking the bread, we will be lifting the cup and remembering how Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And the emphasis that he put on remember, 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 remember what I have told you, what I have been, what I have done. He also tells his followers that he's going to be betrayed, that he's going to be, be beaten, he's going to be killed. And they're horrified, horrified. How could such a thing happen? Peter says, I will never let this happen. And of course, Jesus famously says to him, before the cock crows three times in the morning, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And it's just a hard story. It's a hard view of our, our fallibility. At that table with him, partaking of the thanksgiving, it's not only all of these disciples, Peter, who denied him, the rest of them who, who all ran away, except for Judas, who betrayed him. And yet Jesus, knowing this, still gave them the body, gave them the blood, gave them the bread, gave them the elements that remind us 
of an actual thing that God has already done and planned and intended for us to forgive us for our sins, to save us, to love us, to bring us into wholeness in God's presence. Nobody feels very much wholeness in God's presence at this moment in time. They go off after that to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that will be read on a, a short little video that I made on Friday morning. Um, it'll drop at 8 o'clock in the morning, and so if you go to Facebook Live, at Facebook Church's Facebook page, you will find the video there just ready for you to hear just a little five-minute reading about how Jesus prayed. An important reading, right? Because it emphasizes just ahead of this disastrous situation of Jesus's trial and pop, uh, tor torment and crucifixion, it emphasizes Jesus's true humanity. I think that's important, right? Because there, there were several proclaimed heresies in the early years of the Christian faith that said, well, Jesus didn't really suffer and he was separate and it was all, you can't kill God. But Jesus in Gethsemane says, take this cup away from me. If I don't have to do this, God, I don't want to do this. And his agony and his doubt have sometimes been seen as our salvation hanging in the balance because he almost didn't do it. But that is not what Mark, or what Mark, what Matthew believes. And that is not what I think we believe and affirm either. It is not like there was some magic element that somehow made it all happen. And the whole, you know, many, many hymns about being washed clean in the blood, that's actually an image that comes from the book of Revelation, not from any of the crucifixion stories. So Jesus prays in the garden, goes back, his friends are asleep. They can't stay awake. We think back to the time when they were in the boat and Jesus was sleeping and they woke him up and said, Master, don't you care that we are perishing? And now Jesus is awake because there is a lot of perishing about to be happening. After that, Judas betrays him and Jesus says, just come and do it. In some of the gospels, Judas gives him a kiss, the irony of, of an affectionate display that is actually the act of betrayal, the act of of, of handing him over to the authorities. And Jesus does not put up a fight. When there's a, a fight about to break out, he puts it away. He says, no, I, this is not, no, we are not going to fight on this. We are not going to rebel in this way. You know, if we live by the sword, we will die by the sword. And so it is ordained that we will do something else. And he has taken off. Then on Good Friday, we'll be hearing the story of what happened, about how he was taken to the priests to the high priests and challenged to do some miracles for them, how he was uh, then bound over to Pilate. Um, when he is with the high priests, they are trying to get him to blaspheme, to commit these crimes. They have evidence that somehow he has said he's going to destroy the temple. He's a, he's a seditionist. And Jesus himself talks about the Son of Man and identifies himself not as that, but in his language indicates that the Son of Man will come and the Son of Man, God incarnate, will transform everything. And they say, this is blasphemy. He deserves to be put to death. He's sent off to Pilate. Pilate in Matthew doesn't really want to accept, actually do something with Jesus because this is a troublesome problem in a troublesome province. His wife says, don't have anything to do with him. I had a terrible dream. Don't, don't, don't. And Pilate, famously, after examining Jesus, finds him innocent, washes his hands of the whole matter, takes him out and says to the crowd, who should I free, Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas? And the crowd cries out, free Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And so all of the voices, all of the people are lifted up against him. The disciples have fled out of the garden when he was taken away. Peter has followed and has followed along. When Jesus is in being questioned by Pilate, he is, Peter is three times asked, aren't you with him? Your accent, your way of being, we've seen you. He says, no, 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 I don't even know the man. I deny him, I refuse him. And then the cock crows and Peter in despair goes away. Thinking, I feel quite sure from all the things that ensue in the Gospels, that he has lost the right to even be a, a disciple of Jesus, much less an apostle. His story is another whole set of stories. We'll do that at a later time. <clears throat> For now, we're thinking about how Jesus is then taken off by the Roman soldiers 
to be crucified, a Roman form of death, a Roman form of torturous, awful death. Um, he is beaten. He is mocked. He's put up, given a crown of thorns and a purple robe and, and mockingly called the king of the Jews. And he doesn't put up a fight. He doesn't protest. He doesn't call down the angels. He doesn't do any of the things that Satan tempted him to do way back at the start of his ministry. Instead, he allows this thing to come to pass, even this thing that he did not want to have come to pass. And so on the cross, Jesus is crucified between two thieves or two criminals of various sorts. In some of the accounts, he, he redeems one who declares him to be. In this, this particular account, they both mock him and they say, oh, you trusted that God would deliver you. Why don't you get down off your cross, Mr. Big Man? He is just absolutely humiliated right to the end. In the Gospels, with the exception of um, Luke, where they, they cut a, a slit in his, his chest, Jesus is not bleed. He is not, there's not a, a giant bloody account. I mean, certainly of the pictures that we have of the crucifixion show how awful it was. But um, he's not, this is not about spilling the blood. And it's, this is really important to talk about and think about for Matthew particularly, but for all the Gospels in general, God's saving work is already done. The kingdom of God is already at hand. It doesn't require the spilling of blood to bring it in. It doesn't require the sacrifice for God to act. It requires the sacrifice for the people to understand how they can find their way back to God. That was the goal of presenting a sacrifice in the temple for the faithful Jews. Even when Jesus came to Jerusalem with his parents for what would have been a bar mitzvah, I think. Also, when he was dedicated, they brought doves to sacrifice. Blood for blood, somehow forgiveness has to be achieved. But in the act of crucifixion of Jesus, that whole logic is turned upside down. And so it is not that we have to suffer like Jesus suffered. It is instead to remind us that there is no experience of our lives that is beyond the experience of God. That in Christ, God has faced accusations, God has faced torment, God has faced abandonment, God has faced the, the, the departure of his friends, the betrayal of his friends, God has faced the pain and anguish of being mocked, of being killed in the most awful way. God has known the death that we know. This is powerful, my friends. What is happening is that we, our whole lives, are being sanctified. There is nothing in our lives that is not part of God. Now, is it God's plan for us that we should suffer and go through these things? No, that's stuff that happens. But God is there. Those things happening are not a sign of God's absence and, in fact, may be a much more great evidence of God's presence. Because when we have nothing left, all we've got is God. And so Jesus is on the cross. He is abandoned by everyone except the women who have followed him. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and then the mother of, of James and John, sometimes it's others. In this gospel and in all the gospels, the women are the ones who remain faithful. And in the resurrection story, in some of the accounts, you will see that the apostles thought that this was women's foolishness that they were talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. For the gospeliers, for the people who wrote the gospels, unlike for Paul and for James and for many of the, the um, writers of the epistles, the, the saving act of God is demonstrated in the resurrection. Salvation comes in the resurrection. Although it is interesting that in Jesus' moment of death, the curtain in the temple is ripped in two, and there's an earthquake in the Gospel of Matthew. The curtain that divided the people from God is torn away and the earth shakes. There is now nothing separating us from God. And all of the people who witnessed this had that moment of, oh, wow, was this was really the Son of God? Could it be? Could it be? This is a matter of faith. We're not ever going to prove this. We're not ever going to have something that's so concrete that it's undeniable. We are never going to be able to point to this and say, you see, here's this. We have all sorts of artifacts, and maybe they're real and maybe they aren't. The Shroud of Turin, the pieces of the true cross. 
they are not what is necessary for salvation. What is necessary for us is to realize that our God is always saving us. Our God is always loving us. Our God, even in this most dreadful moment, is surrounding us with the same, same love and with the same concern and with the same identification that we see in Jesus. And so we do not have to fear that we are ever too awful for God, that we are ever too bad. We are God's people. So as we approach this time, I want you to especially hold in your hearts the spirit of Holy Saturday. There's no ritual. There's no rite. There's nothing in the Bible really about it. But there was that dreadful moment after Jesus' death, after his body was put in the tomb, after the tomb was sealed, where for a whole day, through a whole Sabbath day, Jesus' followers sat with the belief, with the complete evidence they thought, that it was finished and that Jesus' ministry had failed. We also have times when we're pretty sure that somehow God has messed up, that somehow God has just not gotten it right, that somehow God has bobbled it with humans, that somehow there has been a separation that cannot be bridged. But my friends, there is bridging of the separation because it has already happened. So I'm going to play a little musical selection, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. We often sing this at funerals. Lead me on, let me stand. I am lost, help find me, God. And then after we hear that, we will have a prayer for these times and these days. Thanks, Pat. I'm going to read the words of that hymn, and then we will pray out of the context of those words. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I'm tired. I am weak. I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, 
Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Let us pray. O oh God, made known to us in the life, the work, the teaching, the healing, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, we ask that you take us by the hand, that you lead us home, that when the day is drear, when the darkness seems to fall in our lives, we can remember that you are still there. When we stand in the shadow of the cross, feeling that we are suffering senselessly, we can remember that even our suffering can be blessed, not because it is good in itself, but because you are even present then. O oh God of all of our days, from creation on, you have wished only good for your children, and yet they have been rebellious. They have challenged you. They have fallen short of your glory. So forgive us our waywardness. In these days of awe, help us to remember again and again how your faithful love has continued to lift us up even when we have turned away. How you have been like the father of the prodigal son, always watching, running down the road to meet us. How you have come among us in the life and the work of Jesus to show us the presence of your kingdom already here, right now with us, and to give us the opportunity to get a vision of the kingdom and begin to live into it. And so we ask that you give us these kingdom visions, and then you give us the wisdom and the courage and the strength to live into them. Help us to help the poor and the hungry, the homeless, the hopeless, the helpless, those who are sick and need prayer to recover, those who are sick and need prayer and love as their days darken, those who have no longer any sort of faith that there will be goodness in the world. In the darkest of times, O oh God, you were there. And now, O oh God, help us to be there for our brothers and sisters, for our fellow believers, and for all, whether they call upon you in the name of Jesus or by another name or no name at all. In these days of awe, as we share communion, bless us. He'll lift us up and remind us that as we remember Jesus, we remember your faithfulness to us, your promise that you will be our God and we will be your people. As we hear the story once again, of the agony in the garden, of the punishments and the, the persecutions of Jesus, of his torment on the cross, and of his death, crying out to you, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remind us over and over again that though we feel forsaken, we are not forsaken. Your love surrounds us and encourages us to go forth even when we struggle to have hope, letting you be our hope letting the way of Jesus be our hope so that we may be hopeful for the world, so that we may begin to see the vision of the kingdom even when times are tough. Oh God, times are very rough right now, and so we pray for people in places of all sorts of catastrophes, for the people whose homes and livelihoods have been shredded to pieces by tornadoes and by storms, for the places that have been drowned out by floods, for the places that have been parched out by droughts, for the places where people are enduring famine, for the places where warfare is raging and taking the lives of your beloved children, for the places where we struggle against one another, the places where we, we accuse one another, where we hate one another for their differences from us, when we find ourselves struggling and sometimes often even failing to love one another as you have loved us. So fill us with your love, O oh God. Remind us that we are made in your image and help us to see your image in one another. Forgive us when we stray. Forgive us when we let the darkness close around our hearts. Forgive us when we turn away instead of turning towards, when we run from the garden, when we betray you. Forgive us when we are not loving enough and turn us once again into the light of your love to show us the pathways of peace, to show us the way of grace and reconciliation and compassion. As we move towards Easter, God, help us not to move so hastily that we do not forget these truths. Lift us up. Show us that there is always hope. Show us that light and life and love is your wish for all of us. 
and then help us to be light and life and love in this world so that others may see it and believe. In Jesus' name, we pray as he taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope that you will join me and the people of North Church in worship on tomorrow, Maundy Thursday at 7 p.m., either live and in person in the sanctuary or on Facebook Live in a, in a live streamed way or as you see it in recordings on our Facebook page. I hope that you will also join us virtually when we will come together across incalculable distances in ways that could never have been imagined in the time of Jesus, but that allow us to be present to one another on Good Friday as we hear again the story of the crucifixion of Jesus and contemplate how hard it is sometimes for us not to cry crucify him with the crowd. On Easter Sunday, we will worship at 10.30 a.m. here in the sanctuary. I encourage you, if it's at all possible, to come in person, to join us, to sing the hallelujahs, to smell the lilies, to, to celebrate, to hear the hallelujah chorus, to rejoice with one another, to enjoy special, special treats and the companionship for the first time in three years of your North Church neighbors and friends, your North Church family on Easter. But if you cannot, join us online. Come and, and be part of that. Sing out loud with the hymns and let the, the music spread all over the world, the expressions of joy, as we begin to understand what it means to live in resurrection life. And so as we go forth understanding the broken parts of the world, help us to remember, or may God help you to remember, that we are always resurrection people. So may God be with you until we meet again.